Hello, I'm Greg Simon, the president of the Biden Cancer Initiative, and we're here today to talk about the drug pipeline in cancer. Joining us is Marcella Moss from Massachusetts General Hospital, Mark Theore from the FDA, Mace Rothenberg from Pfizer, and Peter Adamson from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Thank you all very much for coming. Mark, I want to start with you because I'd like to take the big picture approach and nobody knows the big picture better than the FDA. You've been there since 2009. How would you describe the trends that have emerged over the last nine or 10 years in terms of the drug pipeline what's been dropping out and what's been coming in, so to speak. I think one of the, the ways to think about drug pipeline is not just the therapies that haven't been approved before, but also what are the new uses of previously approved therapies. And just using, for example, last year's approvals, we had 12 new drugs for oncology, drugs that had not been previously marketed before approved through the Center for Drugs. Looking at those uh, new drugs that were approved, two of those were immuno-oncology products. However, if you look at new uses of previously approved drugs, there was over 30 approvals, almost 50% of which were immuno-oncology <coughs> products. Now, interestingly, if you look at one of the most active classes, thinking about the pipeline, the immune checkpoint inhibitors have been clearly uh, leading the charge. Just since 2011, there's been 39 new or supplemental approvals for new uses of these class of agents, majority of which were since 2014. And this is across 11 different cancer types, including one that was based on biomarkers as opposed to a specific type of cancer, which was one of the first what we call site agnostic or tissue agnostic approvals. Thinking down the road, of those 39 approvals that occurred with this class of drugs, there were only five combination approvals, four of which were using the same two drugs. Looking at the data that the Cancer Research Institute did this landmark analysis across immuno-oncology products, published it in the Annals of Oncology, I believe, last, uh, last year, they noted that there were over 1,500 trials looking at immune checkpoint inhibitors. 1,100 of which were in combination uses. So clearly, as we move forward in this field, combinational drug development is going to be very critical to success. Mace, um, you've been at Pfizer since 2008. So you've seen 10 years of, of uh, the uh, pharma side of pipeline development. What are the trends you've seen in terms of how things have changed over that 10-year period, 10 year period? Thanks, right. This has been just an unprecedented era for drug development. We've been able to take the emerging science, what drives the cancer, what are the genomic events that, that cause cancer, now what are the immunologic disruptions that we can cause, and actually brought those to bear on the development of new therapies. And these new therapies are not just a little bit better than the existing therapies, they are transformative. We are seeing tumors that were previously lethal within months, now responding to therapies, and for prolonged periods of time as well. And these were with therapies that, although all therapies have side effects, many of these therapies lack the serious side effects that chemotherapy had, so these individuals are able to maintain their high quality of life and be able to really see a lot of life events that they never thought they would see. So in my 30 years in oncology overall, I've really, um, I think, been the beneficiary of these new therapies and these new advances by seeing how it's helped patients more and more. And I think that the ability to translate science into new medicines is closer aligned and occurs more quickly in, in cancer medicine than any other field of medicine. So Marcella, what's been your observation about the changes in the upstream system in the early stages of drug development and drug discovery in the basic research world? What's, how would you describe the changes you've seen? I think everything has really accelerated in the last couple of years. I think there's been a lot of interest in working in teams and in groups. Traditionally, the academic laboratories were funded mostly by the NIH to really discover some basic sciences, to uh, discover what targets could be addressed with either small molecules or which genes went wrong in particular tumors to develop 
models in which we could test those. But we have never really been in the world of translating those findings directly into patients. That's been something that has traditionally been done by biotechnology companies and pharma companies. And I think we're all actually starting to work together a little bit more with the combination of NIH initiatives, with a combination of foundations that are very interested in taking discoveries from the academic labs into first-in-human trials, and then also partnerships with uh, industry, with biotechnology and, and pharmaceutical companies to take what we learn in the laboratory and be able to shepherd it into the clinic a little bit earlier on and maybe plan for a smaller trial where you can get some proof of concept, where you can see in a, a small trial whether you're getting a, a signal that this is safe, whether you're getting any signal that we're understanding how patients respond to it, and if they don't respond, why is that? And that's something that's done very closely, I think, with, with research labs and with academic hospitals. And once you get a signal for success, then it really needs to move into these larger operations because to be able to make a, a, a new drug, whether it's a, an immune oncology drug or a, a cell-based drug, which is what I work on, you need this massive infrastructure. And that's something that really needs to be done in partnership with, with larger corporations and, and groups that have that. Peter, um, there was a time in history when people treated children as though they were just small adults. But we now know that they're not just small adults. There's a whole different way cancer develops in children and adolescents than adults. How has that made the pipeline in pediatrics a more difficult thing? It's presented challenges as, as well as opportunities. And, and what we're learning about the malignant process is that some of the targets that are relevant for adult cancers are probably relevant for pediatric cancers. But perhaps even more importantly, some of the pathways in a specific adult cancer could be very relevant in an entirely different childhood cancer. So the pathologic names we put on cancer are becoming less relevant than the molecular basis of that cancer. One of the classic examples, we worked with, with Pfizer and, and, and Mace on this, is that they were developing a drug for a rare subset of adults with non-small cell lung cancer. And it turns out that pathway was fundamental to a very rare lymphoma that occurs in teenagers, young adults, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And in a relatively small study, as May pointed out, dramatic activity. So our challenge is to look what is being developed in the adult pipeline and say which of these drugs may be relevant for some children with cancer. So it's, being, um, it's moving forward in anaplastic large cell lymphoma and in a rare type of tumor called neuroblastoma, where progress has been, been more limited. So the most common childhood cancer is, you know, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL. What researchers have done is take out child's own immune system, their cells, re-engineer them to attack the leukemia, CART, CART-19 therapy. And it has really early remarkable results. It's now been approved uh, as a treatment for children with refractory ALL. But it brings a whole new modality to the treatment of children with cancer beyond the very toxic, although effective, very toxic treatments we've had in the past. The other thing we're learning is that childhood cancers are, in fact, fundamentally different at the biologic level. So some of the great advances that we've seen, for instance, in the immune checkpoint inhibitors, is probably going to have a much, much more limited role in children with cancer. The targets that we will need to develop drugs for uh, including the immuno-oncology targets, are likely to be very different than the immuno-oncology targets that may be effective in certain adult cancers. So by refractory, you mean they didn't respond to other treatments? Right, that where our treatments have failed or where our treatments initially worked and the child's cancer relapsed and ultimately our treatment failed. So Mace, I want to, do, I want to use two sports analogies with you. The first one is what I call the children's soccer problem. Uh, Mark mentioned there are over 1,200 combination therapy trials going on. We know there aren't going to be 1,200 drugs approved, and we know there we don't need 1,200 drugs. But it seems like when something new and wonderful occurs, like the use of drugs to bring the immune system to bear on cancer, that all the companies converge on that idea the way children converge on the soccer ball, and there's no one to pass to. Mm -hmm. Wayne Gretzky, the famous hockey player, said he doesn't chase the puck. He goes where the puck is going to be. How do you make these decisions about when to follow the crowd and when to jump ahead and think about the next thing that's going to be around the corner? Uh, that's that's the, the $64,000 question. How do you balance a sure thing if you can somehow improve upon a therapy 
or a, a target a particular genetic abnormality where we know that by inhibiting that, you can have a clinical effect. And how much do you bet on an entirely new target? Because there, the risk is much higher. You are relying on much less evidence. It may be a longer time until you actually can get a drug to the market. So we have to always be weighing those, those things. Maybe the true north that, we, that guides us is, is this going to make a difference to patients? Because that's really what it comes down to. What, whether you're in, in, in the federal government, in cooperative groups, in academic medical centers, or in industry, that's something that binds all of us together. That we're not looking for something that's going to be an incremental advance. We're looking for, for something that's going to make a real difference to patients who need better therapies. So that's what we do. And one of the things we have to recognize is that in none of our domains do we have all the answers, all the knowledge, and all the insight. We have to be able to interact in a very productive way between all of us. And I think that that's one of the changes that we don't talk about as much, but we should, that there's more of an interaction today than there was five or 10 years ago. And it's a very positive interaction. Every one of us has changed over that time, has evolved, but it, all, all with that focus of getting new therapies to the patients who need them. So I think that with all these therapies, you know, Mark mentioned more than 1,200 immunotherapy trials. There are more than 1,000 new cancer medicines in clinical development. So you're absolutely right. There are not 1,000 different targets that we know right now, but there are a lot of drugs that are trying to focus on, can we hit this target more effectively? Do we have more insight into the patients who are likely to benefit? Do we have the right combination that can do something that either drug alone can't do? These are all compelling questions, and all of these need patients to enroll in clinical trials to answer. And that's very often the, the biggest limiting factor for us is how long these clinical trials take to complete because of the lack of patients enrolled in clinical trials. No, that's a great point. Let me stick with that theme a second about the role of patients in the future of the pipeline. So I know there's been a lot of uh, new focus on real-world evidence, so-called real-world evidence, and patient-reported outcomes, not just what the scientists and the doctors observe, but how the patients experience the treatment so that we can try to move to fewer side effects, as an example. What changes are going on at the FDA about the use of so-called real-world evidence and patient-reported outcomes? Oftentimes, when we have a drug that's approved, it's in a particular uh, type of cancer, it's, a, it's based on a clinical trial with several hundred potentially patients. So the safety database is, uh, uh, needs some, some additional evidence, and that's often through real-world evidence, to pick up those more rare events that can occur. From an identification of new uses, for example, with real-world evidence, it's, it's something that we're very interested in on how to best do that, such that it's a scientifically valid method for identifying treatment effects within populations. But in terms of the patient experience with real world evidence or just in general, it is a big focus at FDA and trying to incorporate the patient experience on how they experience the drug from a toxicity perspective is a challenge, but it is something that collaborations with uh, internationally with with industry, pharma, academia, is bringing together the right folks to think about how to best get that information into our label. Thank you. Uh, Marcella, I know that many university researchers, basic researchers, got into the business because of personal experience with themselves or family members or friends who had a particular disease. And yet, if you go through most basic research labs, you don't see a lot of patients. How do we keep the patient in mind at the lab, at the bench? It's not really something that the lab wants it to be that way. I think most, uh, when we have patients come and visit our lab, it's a highlight for all of the researchers because, you know, we're interested in, in, the, in the science of it, but really it's about the patient. It's not about us. Having patients come and visit is a tremendous motivator. And thinking and, and re recognizing that the work that you're doing and the, the science that you're you know, sometimes you struggle with it a little bit. The experiments don't work the way you think they should. But having that patient there uh, is a tremendous motivator for keeping going. Some of that is just uh, sort of structural. You know, we, 
the labs are not necessarily in the same place as where the patient care happens. And so we do have to make some effort to find patients, work with clinicians to be able to involve them. Some of the granting agencies and uh, initiatives now include patient advocates as you're designing your basic research studies. And I think that that's going to be tremendous to be able to maintain the patient at the forefront because I think many of the scientists would really like to participate in those sorts of events. Great. Peter, you have the opposite problem. Um, there's always been a high percentage of children with cancer enrolled in clinical trials, but there haven't been that many clinical trials for new drugs. What, what, how would you describe the problem and, and what can we do about it? So you're right. A lot of the progress we've seen, Greg, is that it's a partnership with, with patients and families, with children and families. And upwards of 60% of families participate in research. Uh, and it stands in sharp contrast for, for various reasons with adults with cancer. But that partnership has always been fundamental to the success. And in general, families not only want better treatment for their own children, they want to help so that no other family has to go through what they've gone through. Over the years, uh, families have been incredibly important partners. Our goal and obligation is to bring the latest science to the treatment of their cancer, no matter how rare. I think the, the challenge that we face as a field is that we, we speak sometimes of childhood cancer as if it were one disease but we actually know it's many. Pathologically, over 100 diseases, and now molecularly, we're, we're creating a landscape where we have very small molecular subtypes. And as you get into the ultra-rare disease space, the economic models for how can a company devote resources and expect to even break even when you're developing a drug for perhaps 100 children a year in the country or 50 children a year in the country, if you're a parent, you really don't care that your child has a rare cancer. You want the best treatment and you want better treatments. So we have to find better models to do this, where, as Mace has pointed out, we are an environment where we have to collaborate. Where I find great encouragement is we're now at a time where everyone recognizes follow the science. If you follow the science and always strive to do what's best for the patient, those two will converge. Terrific. Rick Pazder, who's been the head of oncology at the FDA for a couple of decades, said, you can't be in cancer if you're not an optimist. I think each of you embody that kind of optimism, and, and you give a lot of people a lot of hope. Thank you for being part of this today.